Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today I want to talk about the rabbiting plane, uh, particularly looking at a Stanley and a Miller Falls and doing a few things about how to set them up, how much do they normally cost, where do you find them, and that type of thing. So let's actually dive in and take a look at these. I know a lot of people are really going to want me to talk about Stanley numbers. Stanley made quite a few different rabbiting planes. Uh, the most common is the Stanley 78. Uh, here I have the Miller Falls, was it 84, 85? Um, and this is the Miller Falls version of the Stanley 78. Uh, they also made the 190, the 191, I think a 181, and there were a bunch of other ones in there. I'm, I'm missing quite a few numbers. They all generally work in the same way, especially in the duplex planes, which I'll be talking about that in a minute. And so I'm not going to be talking about any one specific Stanley number. I'm sorry for that. Otherwise, there'd be a lot of videos out there. Um, but I want to show you the basics on what are the reasons for having two beds, how do you set them up, what are the functions, what are items that they need, and how do they work. So. Let's look at this thing a little closer. So before we look at rabbiting planes, we need to know what exactly is a rabbit. Now, if you're on the other side of the pond, you call it a rebate. And it is this notch here in the wood. It's, it's basically half of a groove. So you have a slice down and a slice out. That is a rabbit, runs around along the corner of a board. Whether you call it a rebate or a rabbit generally depends on if you are British or American English, um, but uh, that's it's a rabbit. That's what I'm going to be calling it today. The old style plane is a philister plane, and this is a moving philister plane, and it has a fence on the side, so I can loosen up these screws on the bottom, slide the fence over, and it exposes more of the blade. And then it has a depth stop here, and that I can move up and down to measure the depth of the rabbit. So with those two measurements, I can adjust both the depth of cut and the width of cut, adjusting the fence and the stop. Another item that some of them have is a knicker or a spur, and it's basically a blade that comes down here and sticks down and it basically cuts alongside the iron or just in front of the iron. So as it goes forward, if it's cutting across the grain, that little knife in front will actually cut all the fibers so that the blade coming behind can remove them without tearing out the cross grain fibers. So having that is pretty much necessary for doing cross grain work and it works just like a knife in front of the iron. Most moving philister planes have them and a lot of the Stanley rabbiting planes have them but some of them don't so if it's something you want to do cross grain work make sure you get one with the knicker on there. So first let's look at my Miller Falls 85 and this is basically a Stanley 78 um, just done by Miller Falls um, almost identical system in here and just like the moving philister plane it has a depth stop here that adjusts the same way I can loosen this screw and then slide the foot up and down to adjust the depth of the cut and this thing also has a fence so I can screw on a rod here and then slide the fence onto the rod and now I have a fence that can go underneath adjusting the width of cut. Now a lot of old timers um, didn't use the fence. It was just easier for them to put their finger on there and then use their finger as a fence. So as they slide through their finger makes the mark at the first cut and then every cut after that then rides off the past one. So you're going to see a lot of these that don't have the fence and a lot of them that don't have a depth stop because you just go down until you hit your mark on the side. Um, the fence and depth stop are not needed to make it functional and that's why most of these planes actually don't come with these anymore because they've been lost to time. They were separated from the plane and when they were sold off someone just picked up the plane and didn't have the parts. And buying a depth stop and fence separately often costs more than the entire body of the plane and iron and everything else in great condition. So um, finding those can be a bit difficult. But realize without them it's not really necessary. You can use your fingers as a fence and then you can just eyeball depth and you can get a really accurate cut uh, just the way the old timers would have done it. Also this one has a knicker or a spur and you can rotate it so one of these blades sticks down below the iron and it will act as a knife severing the fibers in front of the iron. Uh, so just like on the moving philister you have that there. It, it just has it on the one side because this is a rabbiting plane not a dado plane. A dado plane would then have a spur on the other side as well but for this one just the one side is needed because you're just cutting down the one side of the rabbit. This brings us to the most common question I get about these is why are there two beds here and why is it when I bought this it only has the one iron? Should it have two irons here? Um, and the answer is no. It's designed to have two beds so that you can move the iron forward onto this front bed. And the nice thing about this front bed is it allows you to get close to things. So I can put it on here and I'm going to slide it down until the iron is touching the wood here. Then I can put my lever cap on there. 
which in this case my screw is down too far, it's not going to work right now. And I can lock it down just like I did before. And then with a plane adjustment mallet, I can tap the iron forward to get the depth of cut, tap it side to side to then give the lateral adjustment. And I'm going to do the same thing on the back, but on the back one, on this particular one, there's actually a depth adjusting lever. Some of them have it, some don't. Um, so you'll need to know on your particular device. And it actually has this little gear that runs in teeth in the back of the iron. So when I put it in there, I want to make sure that that gear then fits into those teeth and adjust it so that it is actually going to be functioning. So I want it to actually push it forward, put in my lever cap, loosen it up a little bit, slide it down in place, make sure that the iron is tight against the bed all the way down. And then I'm going to just lightly tighten this in place. I'm not going to crank it down really hard right now because we have a bit, good bit of adjustment to do here. Now here you can see I have the iron sticking out far on this side and it's not coming close over here. So to adjust it, I'm going to grab my plane adjustment mallet and I'm just going to tap the iron over until I get it close to flush with both sides. And I want to get it really nice and tight so that I'm cutting flush up against the side here. This side doesn't matter so much and it's probably going to stick out a little bit past flush on this side, but I want the iron to be perfectly flush with this side. And the way I can tell that is I can get a straight edge here and I can put it on there and I want to make sure that the iron touches the straight edge just as the side body of the plane does. And then I know the iron is adjusted all the way to the side of the plane. The next thing to check is its depth of cut. It might be cutting deeper on one side or the other, and you can adjust that by tapping the iron back and forth side to side here on the top. That will then pivot the iron back and forth. On this one, it also has a depth adjustment here, so I can use this lever to pull the iron back or to increase the iron, and I can adjust my depth of cut just like that. Now the next question I'm going to get is how do I sharpen this iron and I'm going to sharpen it just like I sharpen any other iron it is I'm going to be flattening the back and I'll usually go coarse medium fine until I get it good. This one is actually in really good shape so I'm just going to be using the fine here. Buff it up a little bit then once I get a nice shine on the back we can strop it and then I'm going to do the exact same thing and this one is actually long enough so if you have a honing guide you can clamp it in there and hone it but I generally just do it freehand. I'll put a couple fingers behind the iron, one finger on top here and then another finger over here so I get an even pressure across, pressure across it. And then I'm going to feel where that bevel is. I can feel if I pull it back here, I'm just riding on the heel. If I move it up here, I'm just balancing on that tip. And so I'm going to go until it locks into that bevel. And I'm going to lock my arms and everything and cut it at that angle. And then once we're getting a nice burr on the back, take it over the strop, remove the burr and we're pretty much good to go. It doesn't take that much more and it's basically the exact same as a chisel or any other plane iron you're going to have. Just a little smaller. Then we can bring it back over, lock it all down, adjust it side to side, forward and backward, and get it nice and tight, ready to cut. Then for the final setup, we just put our depth stop at however deep we want it, about a quarter inch, and here I have it in about a half inch. So our fence is about a half inch, and it's down about a quarter inch, actually a little more than a quarter inch. Let's actually take it for a test run and see how she cuts. So I have a piece of walnut here locked in place, and a lot of people are going to say you should start over here and take a couple light passes and then work your way back. Um, I really don't find much benefit to doing that. I'm just going to pull it all the way back here and cut all the way down. I'm taking a fairly thin cut here. It's not like smoothing shaving thin, it's probably about three thousandths or so. Um, but at this point I can actually see, am I cutting deeper on one side or the other? And in this case I'm finding that I'm actually cutting a little bit deeper on one side. So I'm cutting deeper on the outside than I am on the inside. So that means I need to adjust the tap of this in a little bit. That may have been a bit too much. Or maybe not. No, that's about right. And now, we can go to town until we hit the depth stop here. Now we're cutting really nice, curls and even thickness all the way across, We just keep going until we're down depth. This, this is a lot of fun here, when you're getting that nice zing, let me take it a little bit deeper, because you can, if the grain's running well, take a fairly heavy cut, and that's a really heavy cut. See how that's crispy and crunkly? So I might do that for a few passes until I get down close, then back it off and do a thinner pass for the last one. Once 
One of the common problems that people have is they don't push it up against the fence and they'll let it slowly drift away from the wall. And this wall will start to have an angle on it and it will bevel down in because it will ride against whatever was last there. So just always keep pressure up against it. And you're just going to go until it suddenly stops cutting. Now I've got a pass where I'm just riding on this depth stop all the way across. And it is down to depth. And just like that, we have a rabbit cut out of the wood. So yeah, that is a rabbiting plane, which cuts a rabbit. Now you're going to find these in all different shapes and sizes and uh, conditions. Uh, this particular one I got with the box, it was missing the screw here, which I've just replaced. I paid $35 for it because it came in a box, which I consider to be a fairly good deal. Most of the time I would see them around 40 or 45 for Miller Falls. Um, if you get a Stanley with the box, it is uh, 80, 90, maybe $100. Uh, they're a little bit more desirable. Um, but then you'll find them without the box, without the depth stop, without the cutter. And you usually find the body for around 30 to 40 bucks. Um, and as long as it has the iron and the sole is in good shape, that's a great find because again, you can still use your fingers as the fence and just eyeball depth stop. The first one I purchased was this one, and the previous owner had actually cut off the front duplex on this so that it was right here, and he bent a piece of angle iron on here, creating a new bed. So this one is kind of a, um, a yeah, weirdo, but I, I, it was completely rusted, and so I had to do a sandblasting to clean it up and painted it with my blue. But then he also tapped two holes in here so that you can put a fence on it. And so now this piece of fence, which is just angle iron with screws in it, can go and adjust the fence in and out, which is kind of a nifty way of doing it, which is just a simple piece of angle iron, tap in two holes here, tap in two holes in the body. And so if yours comes without the fence, that might be an answer for you, make your own fence. For comparison's sake, uh, this one in rusted condition I paid 10 bucks for. Um, most of the time when they're completely rusted and needing to be um, totally torn down, 10 to $15 is pretty common for them. And in those conditions, you're almost never gonna find them with the fence and depth stop. Those have disappeared years ago. So just to give you an idea on pricing. So the last question is why do we have this front bed on here? Why is this the second duplex on here? And if you notice that there's only about a quarter inch from the front of the bull nose to where the iron will be cutting. And so that allows you to go up to a stop. So if you didn't want your rabbit to go all the way through the board, you could stop at one point and then every subsequent stop you'll be back a little bit farther, back a little bit farther, back a little bit farther. But you can cut a rabbit this deep and stop about three or four inches away from the end. And that means you're only gonna to have to hand chisel out that three or four inches. Whereas if the iron's all the way back here, you'd have to hand chisel out almost a foot. So moving it all the way forward allows you to get closer and closer to getting right up into a corner. I've even seen a few people who will cut the bull nose off so that the iron can go all the way up into the corner and you can get a nice clean cut all the way up into a dead stop. So the next question is, where in the world do I find these things? And I have a web page set up for that. It's called handtoolfinder.com. Uh, and you can go on there and I have a list of all the places I know of to buy hand tools. I have a map of the entire world with everything I've been told about on the map. So you can go on there and look for all the locations I know about to find tools. I also have a list of online dealers, um, people who specialize in hand tools, who sell things online to people around the world. Um, and you can actually go in there and, and find people who are specifically for Australia or specifically for the US. So if you're looking for a particular tool, you can go down the list and say, hey, do you have one of those? And hey, do you have one of those? And eventually you're gonna have someone say, yeah, I just got one of those in here. There's the price on it. Also on top of that, I have a list of all the hand tool collecting associations I know of. Uh, Midwest Tool Collectors, which is the big one, um, but then there's a lot of other ones. There's, there's some specific to Colorado and California and the Northwest and Australia, and there's even one in Europe and Canada. They're tool collecting associations devoted to a specific area. So go ahead and take a look at all that list and you'd be surprised what you can find on there. Now I'm sure I left off a lot of questions that people have. Um, go ahead and throw them in the comments. I'll get to as many of them as I can. And I uh, do answer as many comments as I possibly can. So feel free to throw those down in there. If you have any thoughts, ideas, snide remarks, questions, let me know. I'd love to read them. So that's about it for today. I hope you like this. If you did, please hit like, comment, and subscribe. That really does help out the channel. And until next time, have a wonderful day.
What do you call a fish with two knees? Toonie fish. <laughs>